For this project, we looked into increasingly popular direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. We wanted to find out about the scientific processes the companies use to produce the genetic profiles for their customers, which mostly include ancestry information and health risks. Then, we wanted to understand what kinds of implications these results have for the individual. As a first step, we wanted to understand the customer's perspective, someone who's actually used these direct-to-consumer genetic testing services. So, we met with a Michigan student whose dad used 23andMe in an effort to find out more about his biological father. He found out that um, it was majority Hispanic, um, would have been his father, actual birth father. Um, so that's sort of really interesting conversations in our family. I personally don't think that having seen on a DNA test that you are Hispanic means that you get to claim any identity or connection whatsoever with anyone of Hispanic origin. My brother and dad both now believe adamantly that they should be able to put down on forms and things that they are of Hispanic origin. I think there were some, it was some like, there were some silly factoids on there like, do you have good caffeine tolerance or are you a night owl or like the BuzzFeed quiz type information. <laughs> um, and but that didn't really change anything about his self-perception, I don't think. Are you going to do anything with this information now that you have it? Personally, no. Uh. First, we wanted to know, what are the scientific processes that direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies use, and are these processes valid? We visited two clinical professors of genetic counseling at the University of Michigan to find out. We have patients who come in who maybe have had genetic testing performed through a direct-to-consumer um, company like 23andMe. And that comes in kind of two different flavors. One is um, they may come in and they've had 23andMe and they've had a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation identified. Um, and in those cases, we're, we feel pretty confident in the accuracy of those results because 23andMe's test has been validated and um, there's quality control that we feel comfortable around in terms of those BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. The other thing that can happen though is that um, my understanding is that consumers or customers of 23andMe can also download their raw genetic data um, from 23andMe and then they can pay another company, an outside vendor, to analyze that data for them. And in that case, we don't counsel based on those results. We actually recommend repeating the analysis with a new, um, usually a new blood sample um, in a lab that has uh, validated testing for that specific gene. short answer is it depends um, and it has the highest sensitivity in general for genes that have been very well characterized um, and if your patient or your individual who wants the answer is from a European ancestry and it's probably reasonable um, but of course it depends on how tight the association is between the gene and the phenotype or clinical issue that you're trying to understand. Where it starts to fall apart is where we start to think about uh, traits in which there are multiple genes that are impacting the presence or the presentation of a particular clinical issue. And so knowing what all those genes are is the work of current scientists. And so using technology that looks at single nucleotide polymorphisms that may or may not be associated with a particular trait would be much less sensitive or accurate. Next we wanted to know what are some of the psychological impacts of receiving results from direct-to-consumer genetic testing? How could these results change self-perception or behaviors? One of the major psychosocial impacts, at least in a pediatric setting, is often feelings of guilt. So parents, once they get that final genetic answer, um, some subset will be excited and feel really good about it and like, a I really got, finally got an answer. But they can't always appreciate that, meanwhile, their child has been growing and developing and becoming a person and part of their family. And doing the genetic testing and choosing to maybe terminate a pregnancy 
for the same diagnosis of a child you already have often leads to quite negative connotations for them in terms of devaluing who their child is. Finally, also to think about what's the future going to look like for my child? What do I need to do from a medical perspective to optimize their health, to optimize their intellectual capacity, um, and to give them the highest quality of life? And so for parents, that uncertainty can be quite difficult to navigate and to manage. Um, because they think of genetic testing as giving them the answer and giving them a comprehensive answer. But often when we do this new testing, we don't get results that are positive or negative. We get results that are called variants of uncertain significance or variants that we think maybe could lead to disease, but we don't know enough yet to be able to say thumbs up or thumbs down definitively. The ones that I think um, I'm pretty confident that many of our patients make are changes in kind of their screening habits. I see positive aspects of um, generalized access of genetic testing for everybody, um, but not without the back-end support that you need to really make sense of it. Usually if um, somebody asks me what they, whether they should do 23 and me, I say, you know, well, why do you think you'd want to do it? And if it has anything to do with I'm concerned about my health, then I say, you know, well, that wouldn't be the test I would recommend if you were trying to actually think about a, a medical problem in, in yourself or in your family. I usually um, tell them that I think it uh, can be a fun activity. Um, I like to call it recreational genetics.